The National Communications Network, in collaboration with the National Center for Resource Development and the Ministry of Education, present CXC in Focus, a focus on the key subject areas of mathematics and English for students preparing to write the exams. Welcome to another program, CXC Mathematics in Focus. Lesson 35, Transformation, Reflection. In the last lesson, we explored matrices and developed matrix operators that ca can apply to coordinate geometry to transform shapes. In this lesson, we are going to use the matrix operators to coordinate points of shapes on the coordinate plane. In the next slide, we will establish some basic reference lines. Lines of reference on the coordinate plane. The horizontal line is the x-axis or the equation of the x-axis is y is equal to zero. The vertical line, commonly referred to as the y-axis, and in the form of an equation, it is a line x equal to zero. The line going down from the top right to the bottom left, making 45 degrees with the x-axis, 45 degrees with the y-axis, or the line bisecting the right angle there, that line is the line y is equal to x. The equation of that line is y is equal to x. Any coordinate point along that line will have an x value equal to the y value. Look at the line going the other way, that is, from top left to bottom right. Again, it is dividing the left hand right angle into two equal parts, bisecting it. And the equation of that line is y is equal to minus x. Again, any point along that line, the, the y value would be minus the x value. An approach to solving geometrical problems is through reflection in a mirror or a mirror line. On the coordinate plane, points or plane shapes can be reflected in a given line and deductions can be made about the image of the reflection. For example, if we select the x-axis as the mirror line or the axis of reflection or the line of reflection or sometimes we say the axis of symmetry and we select the point P 3, 2. 3, 2 is called the object. That's P. If P is reflected on the x-axis, the image will fall below the x-axis as seen as P dash. And that P dash is the image of P. And the coordinates of that image is 3, negative 2, or 3, minus 2. So if a mirror is placed along the mirror line with the reflecting face facing P and you look into the mirror, what you would see in the mirror is what appears as the image on the coordinate plane, which is in the fourth quadrant. Reflecting from the first quadrant will give us an image in the fourth quadrant. The matrix operator for reflection in the x-axis. We have a matrix operator that can do that. 
here it is. It's a matrix 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And when this matrix is applied to the point P, 3, 2, we have P dash, which is 3 minus 2. And if you do that matrix multiplication on the left-hand side of the equation, you will end up with a result which is on the right-hand side. That is, when we reflect P, 3, 2, in the x-axis, we'll have P dash 3 minus 2. This confirms our practical observation in the previous slide, which is if we apply matrix M to x, y, it will give us uh, an image x minus y. When we apply the matrix to the point 3, 2, we will have the image 3 minus 2. Let's look at another example. This time we are using the y-axis as the mirror line. We have another object, which is Q. Q is the point 3, 2. That is our object. We put the mirror along the y-axis with the reflecting face facing Q. Looking into the mirror, we would see that the image from the first quadrant is in the second quadrant. So Q3, 2 will be Q dash minus 3, 2. Minus 3, 2 is the image of 3, 2 when 3, 2 is reflected in the y-axis. The matrix operator for reflection in the y-axis is minus 1, 0, 0, 1. And when applied to the point Q, which is 3, 2, we have Q dash, which is minus 3, 2. So the matrix operator minus 1, 0, 0, 1, multiplied by the matrix Q, 3, 2, we'll have the image Q dash, which is minus 3, 2. This confirms our practical observation in the previous slide, which is when we map X, Y using the matrix for reflection in the Y axis, we'll have an image minus X, Y. So when the matrix operator is applied to 3, 2, we'll have an image minus 3, 2. Let's check reflection in the line y equal x. The line y is equal x is a line sloping from top right to bottom left. We look at the point x x being our object, x is the point 3, 1. If the mirror is placed along the line y equal x, and we look into the mirror, we would see x dash, which is the point 1, 3. So when x, 3, 1 is reflected in the line y is equal to x, we'll have the image x dash 1, 3. The matrix operator for reflection in the line y is equal to x is 0, 1, 1, 0. And when applied to the point x, 3, 1, we have 1, 3, which is x dash. Now, 0, 1, 1, 0 multiplied by 3, 1 will give us 1, 3. So the object x, 1, 3, when reflected in the y, the line y is equal to x, will give us an image x dash 1, 3. Again, this confirms our practical observation 
in the previous slide which is saying the reflection well, the practical observation is saying m operating on x y will produce an image y x that is exchanging the x value and the y value. So, m operating on 3 1 will give us an image 1 3 just switch them around. Let us look at reflection in a line y is equal to minus x y is equal to minus x that line is going from top left to bottom right and it is written there y is equal to minus x. We want to reflect the object x which is 2 1 in the line y is equal to minus x. That is you put a mirror along the line y equal minus x look into the mirror you would see the, ob the image in the third quadrant that is mark x dash which is minus 1 minus 2. The matrix operator for reflection in the line y equal minus x is 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0. And when applied to the point y, 2, 1, we have as seen there y dash which will be minus 1, minus 2. So, the matrix operator 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0 on the point 2, 1 will produce an image y dash minus 1, minus 2. This conforms our practical observation in the previous slide which is when the operator is operating on the point x, y we would have an image minus y, minus x. Applying that to the point 2, 1, it will give us an image minus 1, minus 2. Let us look at the mirror line y equal to x and now we are going to reflect two points. The points we would be reflecting are q and p. Notice where q is. Q is in the first quadrant and p is in the fourth quadrant. The point q is 3, 2. The point p is 2 minus 3. The mirror is placed along the line y is equal to x. Mark the mirror line there. And when you look into the mirror, q 3, 2 would give us an image q dash 2, 3. And p, which is 2 minus 3, when reflected in the mirror line, will produce an image p dash, which is minus 3, 2. Now, let us look at reflecting a triangle in the line y is equal to x. We are reflecting triangle LMO that is seen in partly in the first quadrant and in the second quadrant. L is minus 3, 2, M is 2, 3, and O is the origin which is 0, 0. If we place the mirror on the line y equal to x, with the reflecting face facing triangle LMO, which is called the object, and you look into the mirror, what you would see in the mirror is the image which is below the line, mark M dash, L dash, O dash, or L dash, M dash, O dash, it would be the same. Use the same matrix operator on each of the points given will provide us with the coordinates of the image and when they are plotted on the graph paper and drawn 
we'll have that image. That is, when we reflect a triangle, we'll get a triangle. And the size of the triangle reflected will be the same as the image. The matrix operator for reflection in a line y equal x is 0, 1, 1, 0. And when applied to the point x, 3, 1, we have 0, 1, 1, 0. L, M, O, those are the coordinate points. L is minus 3, 2. M is 2, 3. O is 0, 0. When that multiplication is done, we will have L dash, which is the image of L, which will turn out to be 2 minus 3. Then we'll have M dash, which is the image of M, which will be the point 3, 2. And when it is applied to the origin, that is O, it will give us 0, 0. So when those points are plotted, it's a triangle we obtained previously. This confirms our practical observation in the previous slide, which is for L, when a matrix is operating on L, which is minus 3, 2, we'll have M dash, which is 2 minus 3. That's the image of the reflection of L. When M is operating on 2, 3, we'll have an M dash, which is 3, 2. When it is operated on O, which is the origin 0, 0, we'll have the image also being 0, 0. Here is your problem for today. The first problem. On the graph, on the graph paper provided, draw a triangle with coordinates 2, 1, 3, 3, and 4, 3. Label it A, part 2. Written this as part 1, is part 2. Draw the image of A after a reflection in the line y is equal to minus 1. This question is taken from CXE January 2005 with slight modification. The second question. On graph paper provided, draw the x-axis and the y-axis using a scale of 1 cm to represent one unit on both axes draw the triangle def with vertices d11 e31 and f14 part b draw the image of triangle DEF on the reflection in the line X is equal to 4. Name the image D dash, E dash, F dash. Question taken from CXE June 2005. Here is the problem given to you in the last lesson. Under a transformation T, represented by the matrix P, Q, R, S. The points A, minus 4, 2, and B, minus 2, 5, are mapped onto A dash, minus 2, 4, and B dash, minus 5, 2, respectively. Using a matrix method, 1, determine the vertices of P, Q, R, S. Part 2. Calculate the coordinates of the point C dash, which is the image of C minus 2, 2 on the transformation T. Question taken from CXC January 2005. Here is the solution to the problem. P, Q, R, S, one matrix, minus 4, minus 2, 2, 5, the other matrix, we multiply the two, which will give us 
minus 2 minus 5 4 2 multiplying out the left hand side we'll have minus 4p minus 2p minus 2p plus 5q minus 4r plus 2s minus 2r plus 5s and that will be equal to what is on the right hand side minus 2 minus 5 4 2 these can be simplified which will give us minus 4p plus 2q is equal to minus 2 minus 2p plus 5q is equal to minus 5 that will give us the first pair of our simultaneous equation and sorry about the curve the curly bracket jump up on the computer the second pair of equation from the matrix multiplication is minus 4r plus 2s is equal to 4 and minus 2r plus 5s is equal to 2. When these pairs of equations are solved, we will get for the first pair, p is equal to 0 and q is equal to minus 1. For the second pair of equation, when solved, you will have r is equal to minus 1 and s is equal to 0. This brings us to the end of today's program, CXE Mathematics in Focus. In this lesson, we will examine the uses of the hyphen, the dash, the apostrophe, and quotation marks. We will then give attention to some practice exercises. The hyphen. The hyphen is used between the parts of a compound word or between the syllables of a word, especially when it is divided at the end of a line. It is often confused with a dash, which is a longer symbol and has different functions. Let us look at some examples of the use of the hyphen. Self-motivated, 75, mother-in-law, state-of-the-art equipment, thought-provoking question, fun-loving person. Let us now turn our attention to the dash. The dash is used to cut off an afterthought or an added example or explanation from the rest of the sentence. For example, the handbag, the last in the showcase, was sold for half the price. Before an echo word, for example, she dwells with beauty, beauty that must die. We will now look at the use of the apostrophe. The apostrophe is used in contractions. Let us examine a few examples. Wasn't for was not. IT apostrophe S for it is. And here I must caution you students. Many persons confuse IT apostrophe S with ITS. The word ITS is a possessive pronoun. For example, we say, the dog licked its paws, and not the dog licked IT apostrophe S paws. I'll is a shortened way of saying I will. Use the apostrophe to indicate possession. For example, the boy's B-O-Y apostrophe S score was lower than the girl's. The boy's B-O-Y-S apostrophe scores were lower than the girl's G-I-R-L-S apostrophe. The store only sells men's shoes. The children's behavior at the rally was commendable. Note, in the first two examples, that the apostrophe comes before T-H-E apostrophe S in the singular case, and after the S 
in the plural case. Use the apostrophe to indicate the plural of letters and numbers. For example, the teacher told the students to write a word containing three E's. I teach two form fives. Mind your P's and Q's. Next, we'll discuss the uses of quotation marks or inverted commas as they are also known by. Let us examine some of the quotation marks. Use double quotation marks for direct speech. For example, I am studying hard for my examination, Mary said. The president of the tour club called, he said, and informed me that the trip is postponed. Note carefully that only the words spoken are in quotation marks. That is because those are the words that are directly quoted by the speaker. You also need to pay attention to how the comma is used in direct speech. Use double quotation marks for short passages borrowed from written sources and, and integrated within the text of your written work. For example, according to King Solomon in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 13, happy is the man that finds wisdom. Note, long quotations are indented and written in block form without the use of quotation marks. Use double quotation marks for minor titles of written works. For example, Louise Bennett's poem, No Little Twang, was performed at dramatic poetry competition. John Steinbeck's novel, The Pearl, is on the CXC syllabus. Use quotation marks around words that you wish to highlight or draw special attention to. For example, the word psychology is often misspelled. Be careful how you use the term AIDS. You can also enclose a word in quotation marks when using it sarcastically. For example, our history teacher is gifted in putting us to sleep during his classes. For quotes within quotes, Use double quotation marks for the outer quotation and single quotation marks for the inner quotation. Let us look at two examples. The teacher said to us, I want you to change the phrase in the morning to during the day in your first paragraph. Yesterday, I read about a terrible accident in Kaichu News said Nick. Here are a few points to note when using quotation marks. The first spoken word must be capitalized even if it comes in the middle of a sentence. A comma or some other punctuation mark is required before the verb of saying or after the verb of saying if the quoted words continue. For example, there were no buses, he replied, and I had to get a taxi. Punctuation marks connected with the quoted words are placed inside quotation marks. How beautiful those trees look, she exclaimed. When using dialogue in a story, it is usual to begin a new line every time there is a new speaker. Let us examine the following example. At the sight of her face, the smile vanished from his own, and he stood waiting nervously for ill news. Oh dear, moaned his wife. What's the matter? said Mr. Pinner anxiously. Mrs. Pinner supported herself by the table and shook her head despondently. He's dead. She said with a tone of utmost solemnity, Dead? 
repeated her husband, staring violently. Now, let's do some practice work. Practice one. Choose the correctly punctuated sentence from each group of sentences below. A. Being late, he was full of apologies. Being late, comma, he was full of apologies. Being late, comma, he was, comma, full of apologies. Let's look at them carefully. Which sentence is correctly punctuated? B. Here, the comma marks off the introductory phrase, being late. You can come, she said, when you are ready. You can come, she said, when you are ready. You can come, she said, when you are ready. Which sentence is correctly punctuated? C is the correct one. Let's look at another one. Wishing to increase his education, he reads a lot of books at home. Wishing, comma, to increase his education, comma, he reads a lot of books at home. C. Wishing to increase his education, comma, he reads a lot of books at home. The correct answer here is again C. And the comma marks off an introductory phrase. Our fourth example, when our cat died, she was very old. We buried her under the mango tree. When our cat died, she was very old, dash. We buried her under the mango tree. When our cat died, dash, she was very old, comma. We buried her under the mango tree. The response here, the correct answer is A. Here, the dash is used to mark off an added thought from the rest of the sentence. Five, the chairman interrupted Mr. White. You must stick to the point. The chairman interrupted. Mr. White, you must stick to the point. The chairman interrupted Mr. White. You must stick to the point. Which sentence is correctly punctuated? As you can see, sentence B is a correctly punctuated one. Practice two. Let us now punctuate some sentences using quotation marks as required. Here are the sentences. He asked me if I knew who wrote the poem God's work. To be or not to be is one of the most famous speeches in Shakespeare's plays. What does the word conversation mean? Pizza came into the English language from Italian. I saw Sister Sister on television last night. Let us now examine the responses. He asked me if I knew who wrote the poem God's Work. And God's Work, as you see, is in quotation marks. Quotation, we open, to be or not to be, we close, is one of the most famous speeches in Shakespeare's plays. What does the word conversation mean? And we have conversation in quotation marks. Pizza, in quotation marks, came into the English language from Italian. I saw a sister sister quotation marks, on television last night. Let us consider the following extract and then try to punctuate it. Jack pointed down, that's where we landed beyond falls and cliffs. There was a gash visible in the trees. There were the splinter tree trunks and then the drag leaving only a fringe of palm between the scar and the sea. There, too, jutting into the lagoon was a platform with insect-like figures moving near it. Let us now punctuate this passage. 
Jack pointed down. That's where we landed, beyond falls and cliffs. There was a gash visible in the trees. There were the splintered tree trunks and then the drag, leaving only a fringe of palm between the scar and the sea. There too, jutting into the lagoon, was a platform with insect-like figures moving near it. You recognize the different students as we read. Without punctuation, there is no sense in the first, as, as we see in the first passage. Let us now examine the final passage and punctuate it. Father shook his head as his son John left the room for the third successive month. His report card showed nothing but D's. I'm finally convinced he told his wife that John must have a sixth sense. What makes you think that she replied in a puzzled tone? Well, said her husband, his report card shows no sign of the other senses. So. Now, as we read that, students, you will recognize that it doesn't make much sense. Let's now try to punctuate it. Father shook his head as his son John left the room. For the third successive month, his report card showed nothing but D's. I'm finally convinced, he told his wife, that John must have a sixth sense. What makes you think that, she replied in a puzzled tone. Well, said her husband, his report cards show no signs of the other five. So boys and girls, we must continue to practice our punctuation marks so that we can write error-free language in our examination. And until the next time, I'm Ingrid Fong saying good evening on behalf of Bibi Ali, Parmeshwar Lal, and Ranch Chester. The National Communications Network, in collaboration with the National Center for Resource Development and the Ministry of Education, present CXC in Focus, a focus on the key subject areas of mathematics and English for students preparing to write the exams. Welcome to another program, CXC Mathematics in Focus. Lesson 36. Transformation, Rotation. In the last lesson, we discovered how matrix operators that can apply to coordinate geometry to reflect shapes in given lines of reflection or lines of symmetry. In this lesson, we are going to use the matrix operators for rotation of shapes on the coordinate plane. An approach to solving geometrical problems is through rotation about a given point, called the center of rotation. On the coordinate plane, points or plane shapes can be rotated about a given point and deductions made about the image of the rotation. Look at the sketch of the graph here. We have the x-axis, which is the horizontal line, the y-axis, which is the vertical line, and the origin. Usually we will rotate objects about the origin, but not always about the origin. And that is called the center of the rotation. That is, if you pin the two paper on the origin, and rotate one, that point at the origin is called the center of rotation. 
clockwise rotation about the origin. Clockwise rotation is rotation following the movement of the hand, the hands of the clock. And so the arrow is indicating rotation in a clockwise manner. Similarly, anti-clockwise rotation about the origin. It will go the opposite way of the movement of the clock hand. And so the arrow is indicating how the movement is done on the coordinate plane. The clockwise rotation of 90 degrees about the origin, that is, if we take the point P, which is 2, 1, and rotate it 90 degrees following the arrow, the direction of the arrow, it will move from the first quadrant into the second quadrant. And if you have tracing paper, and on top of your graph paper, you put the tracing paper, put a pin at the origin, and spin the tracing paper 90 degrees, you will find that the point P, which is 2, 1, will fall on top of P dash which is 1 minus 2. Now, earlier we spoke about matrix operator. Mm -hmm. In this case, the matrix operator for rotation of 90 degrees about the origin is 0, 1, minus 1, 0. If this operator is applied to the point P21 and the calculation is done, we will have a result P dash, which is 1 minus 2. Clockwise or anti-clockwise rotation of 180 degrees about the origin. Now, from your trial, you would see that if we go 180 degrees clockwise or we go 180 degrees anti-clockwise, we'll end up at the same point. And you can try it out. Let's see. Let's take the point Q, which is your object. The coordinates of the point Q are 2, 1. If we rotate following the same method I explained to you earlier, using tracing paper and a pin to pin the tracing paper onto the graph paper at the origin and rotating Q 180 degrees either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Q will fall exactly on Q dash which is in the third quadrant. You can see it there. So Q will fall exactly on Q dash in the third quadrant quadrant with coordinates minus 2, minus 1. And the matrix operator that can do that is minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1. So if that matrix multiplies the, ma the coordinate point Q to 1, when that multiplication is done, you will end up with a result minus 2, minus 1. So we can do rotation practically using tracing paper and graph paper, or it could be done algebraically, just do the matrix operation. That is, you multiply the operator and the coordinate point, and you'll end up with the same result. anti-clockwise rotation of 90 degrees about the origin. Anti-clockwise rotation will go contrary to the movement of the hand of a clock, as indicated with the arrow there. Let's take the point X, which is our object. 
x is the point 1, 2, marked there in the first quadrant. If we rotate anti-clockwise 90 degrees, that point will fall in the second quadrant. And if we do the rotation with tracing paper, x will fall exactly on x dash, which is 1, 2, when rotated 90 degrees anti-clockwise, will be x dash minus 2, 1. And the matrix operator that can do that, if you don't want to do the exercise graphically, and you remember the operator doing rotation 90 degrees anti-clockwise, you can apply it. That is, the matrix operator is 0, minus 1, 1, 0. When that operator multiplies, 1, 2, we'll end up with a result minus 2, 1 as the image for x. The diagram below shows quadrilateral PQRS and its image, which is quadrilateral P dash, Q dash, R dash, S dash, after it has been rotated. Part A of the question, state the coordinates of the, point R, the points R dash and S dash. And part B, describe the rotation completely. This question is taken from CXE January 2006. And if you do the practical rotation, you would see that R dash will be the point minus 2, 4. You can read that even from the graphical presentation. And S dash would be the point minus 4, 1. If you do some practical work and try it out, you would find that PQRS, when rotated about the origin 90 degrees anti-clockwise, not about the origin, about the point zero one. When if, remember that, we are rotating about the point zero one, and PQRS will fit exactly on P dash, Q dash, R dash, and S dash. And you'll remember that if we rotate a quadrilateral, we will get a quadrilateral. The size will remain the same. So the object is congruent to the image. Here is your question for today, part A. On the graph paper below, triangle ABC is mapped onto triangle A dash, B dash, C dash on the, a reflection. Write down the equation of the mirror line. And note there that the image, the reflection, is in dotted line. Part B of the question. Triangle A dash, B dash, C dash is mapped onto triangle A double dash, B double dash, C double dash, by a rotation of 180 degrees about the point 5, 4. Part 1, determine the coordinates of the vertices A double dash, B double dash, C double dash. Part 2, state the transformation that maps triangle ABC onto triangle A double dash, B double dash, C double dash. Question taken from CXE January 2007. This is the problem given to you in the last lesson. Two problems. Problem one, on graph paper provided, 
draw a triangle with coordinates 2, 1, 3, 3, 4, 3 and label it A. Part 2. Draw the image of A after a reflection in a line y is equal to minus 1. Question taken from CXC January 2005 with slight modification. Part 2. A. On graph paper, draw the x-axis and the y-axis. Using a scale of 1 cm to represent one unit on both axes, draw the triangle DEF with vertices D11, E31, and F14. And part B, draw the image of triangle DEF on the reflection in the line x equal 4. Name the image D dash E dash F dash. Question taken from June 2005. Here's solution to number 2. The line of reflection is x is equal to 4 because if you place your mirror along that line x equal 4 facing the triangle DEF, you will see the image E dash, D dash, F dash in the mirror. This brings us to the end of today's program, CXC Mathematics in Focus. Boys and girls, comprehension continues to present a stiff challenge to candidates. Each year, the report on the examinations stresses the need for students to be given more practice in answering comprehension questions. These questions operate at two levels. At the first level, you can understand the literal meaning or factual information in a piece of writing. At the second level, you can understand other aspects of meaning, such as impressions, feelings, mood, and tone. You should be able to judge a writer's intention, attitude, and the following guidelines should prove to be very helpful to you. One, read the passage carefully several times. This seems obvious advice but it is surprising how many students assume that a quick skim through the passage is sufficient to enable them to answer the questions set. By all means, read the passage through quickly at first to get a general idea of the theme, but then you must read it through slowly again and carefully at least twice before going on to answer the questions. Next, Look at the questions and work out mentally whereabouts in the passage the information for the answer lies and what the answer is. Don't be too much in a hurry to start writing. The most useful work is done in this preliminary time when you become familiar with the questions and the passage. Make sure that you understand the questions asked. Too often students just glance at the questions and do not fully appreciate their implications. Study the questions and break them down into simpler statements. Ask yourself what information is really being asked for. Make sure that your answer is relevant. Keep looking back at the question to ensure that the information you are giving is the information being asked for. When you have completed your answer, ask yourself, have I answered the question? Sometimes students go rambling on and give more information than is required or simply repeat themselves. Answer what is asked for and then stop. Use your own words unless asked to quote. Remember that the purpose of a comprehension exercise is to see whether or not you have understood the passage. 
if you merely copy out lines from the passage as your answer, then there is no evidence that you have understood what those lines mean. Obviously, it is not always possible to use entirely different words when the words are simple or involve technical terms, but you should at least try. Keep to the facts given in the passage unless otherwise asked. As I mentioned before, the purpose of the comprehension exercise is to see whether you understand the passage and to see how much you knew about the subject discussed in the passage. Most comprehension questions require you to find information from the passage to answer questions. Do not start adding your own information or arguing about the point of view being expressed unless the question specifically asks you to do so. Quite often there is a question of the end which asks you to give your opinion. That is the only kind of question where your own views should be allowed to enter. Answer your questions clearly, concisely, and in grammatically correct English. Now students, I know that these are a lot of points for you to remember, but they are essential to follow if you are to be able to be successful at examination. Refer to them every now and then when you have to answer a comprehension exercise so that you can get in the habit of following this advice. It is also useful to consider the different kinds of questions you could be asked about a piece of writing. Here are some examples. Meaning. You could be asked to explain the meaning of a word or phrase as is used in the passage. The phrase in italics is important. For instance, when you see the word bank in a passage, you may immediately think of the building where money is kept. But the meaning of the passage may be the side of a river. You will only be able to tell this by studying the context in which the word appears. Make sure that you explain a word or phrase fully. Do not explain a part of it or use the words you are asked to explain in your own explanation. Translate the whole phrase. For instance, if you are asked to explain the phrase, the sea encroached on the shore, an answer which says the sea came on the land is only half the answer. The answer would be better. The waves gradually covered and took over the sand. You may also be asked to state what the passage or some part of the passage is about. So, make sure that you have understood it. For instance, if the piece of writing is about a character running away from home, you may be asked, what is a character doing? Reading between the lines. Writers do not always state facts directly. They imply emotions and attitudes that suggest point of view, and they depend upon the reader being perceptive Reading between the lines. Writers do not always state facts directly. They imply emotions and attitudes that suggest point of view. And they depend upon the reader being perceptive enough to be able to read between the lines and understand what the writer is getting at. For instance, the writer may not state directly that he dislikes a particular character he's writing about. But the words he uses to describe the character and the situations he presents him in may convey the author's attitude towards the character 
And that attitude is passed on to the perceptive reader. Let us look at this example. Mary looked at her mother for a moment without speaking. Her mouth was straight and hard. Her eyes were narrowed and burned strangely. When her mother asked the question again, she turned her head away and did not answer. A question in this passage may be, how does Mary feel towards her mother? The writer does not tell us in so many words. The reader has to read between the lines and use the clues the writer gives us. An answer might be, Mary feels hatred or resentment or anger towards her mother. The rest of the passage may enable the reader to narrate down more precisely. Many comprehension questions will demand this kind of deduction. In the next lesson, we will look at four other kinds of questions that could be asked about a piece of writing. Now, let us recap the instructions on how we would approach our comprehension as discussed earlier. Read the passage carefully several times. Make sure you understand the questions asked. Make sure that your answer is relevant. Use your own words unless you are asked to quote. Keep the facts given in the passage unless otherwise asked. Answer your questions clearly, concisely, and in grammatically correct English. Until the next time, boys and girls, on behalf of Viviali Pameshwar Lal and Ranchi Chester, I'm in the phone saying thank you for being here.